get started right away. And what I wanted to start is by saying that the energy that we deposit in patients, it's, called, it's measured in watts. However, grays are the concentration, so it's going to be energy over mass. Electron density approximates material density for purposes of diagnostic imaging. Wavelength equals velocity over frequency, therefore wavelengths and frequency are inversely related. This is the typical diagram in which we see that all of these energies here all have the same velocity. They have It's defined by the speed of light. However, their wavelengths and their frequency are going to be inversely proportional. So if you have a a gamma ray with a high frequency, we know that they will have high energy. High frequency, high energy, high wavelength or long wavelength will be low energy. So it's inversely proportional. If I have a, uh, if I have a long wavelength, then I know uh, that my energy is lower because my frequency is also going to be lower. In this case, we have a short wavelength combined in the region of high frequency. So short wavelength is equivalent to a high frequency, and this is a type of x-ray that will have high energy. Moving on, this diagram is showing you x-ray production, we have the patient, we have the screens, and we have the film. We also have the grids right there. And I want you to focus really on this number. Everything I haven't read on this video, you should probably memorize. And three milligrays right here is for an abdominal radiograph. That's going to be the entrance air kerma or how many photons we're delivering based on how we calculate entrance air kerma. But you should just know that three milligrays is an approximation. All these numbers are going to be approximations and you're going to memorize them and they will help you figure out questions. So three milligrays in the abdomen will give you a framework. And when you move to a chest radiograph, we know that we should, because it's lungs and air, we should have a lower amount of photons delivered. And we know that it's less than three milligrays. In fact, it might be more like 0 0.1 milligrays but we know that if we use three for the abdomen, it's going to be much lower for the chest. The other fact that we should remember is that once we deliver the radiation or the kerma, so for example here we have 200, this is representing our patient, it goes through our patient, it, it goes through the tabletop, and by the time it comes out, we already have about 1%. So we started with 200, it went down to just two, and that represents 1% of our initial x-ray. And then we have our Bucky uh, factor, our Bucky grid, and then we know that that's gonna decrease further. So the 0.5 number here is what's actually reaching my detector. And therefore it is said that the amount of energy or x-rays reaching my receptor is often less than one percent than what my air kerma is and as you see there's a lot of one percent in in radiology and we were talking about how you know from x-ray production to um you know to this part here then you know x-ray production we have one percent of, of x-rays are produced when we're doing when we're talking about the x-ray tube and now uh, another 1% is showing here. So that's probably worthwhile knowing. What I'm illustrating on this next picture is the inverse square law. And for the purposes of the patient, we'll talk about inverse square law later in terms of, of uh, interventional radiology. But for the purpose of the patient, what we have here is how the the distance from our source to our patient is increased and our radiation concentration is decreased, okay? And that's the inverse square law. So you can see the beam here is more concentrated. However, when we go 
when we move our x-ray tube farther back, our concentration is much less. And you can see just a graphical representation of that. And what this means is that our risk for skin damage is much lower because we are reducing that concentration. However, the total amount of radiation, according to this diagram, is still being delivered. So that won't change the stochastic risk for the patient. K-shell binding energy, we need to know that it's usually in the order of KEVs. For example, lead is going to have an 88 uh, KEV binding energy of the K-shell, while oxygen should say 0.5 KEV will be the binding energy for the K-shell. The ratio K-shell versus outer shell um, electrons is going to be 1,000 to 1. And that's the difference in their binding energies. If we double the energy, we double the frequency. That's from what we talked before. And characteristic x-rays are the x-rays that we use for imaging and mammography. Remember that mammography was one of the only modalities in which we do the filtration uh, be before for the lower energy photons and we also do filtration for the higher energy photons. So mammography is perhaps our most uh, monoenergetic or, or beam that approaches the most monoenergetic form because we're filtering at both sides. Always remember that your energy average is below your characteristic x-ray. For angiograms, our energy average is going to be 35 keV. And that's, remember that we, our kVp will be usually twice as high as our average energy. And just remember the number of the 35 keV for average energy. Our average keV for CT is going to be 60 keV. The average X-ray beam is not affected by MA or exposure time. Coherent scatter tends to be less than 5%, and photoelectric dominates at low energy level and high atomic number. Compton dominates in soft tissue when KeV is greater than 25. At 25 KeV, we have the same ratio of photoelectric and Compton interactions, and this is specific for soft tissues. In radiography, if we move from 50 kV to 100 kV, the number of photons is increased by 4. The K edge for iodine is 33 kV, and you need to remember that because it's a fairly important concept in all of diagnostic imaging. Scatter is isotropic, meaning that it can go in any direction. 1% of x-rays are transmitted through 20 centimeters of water or tissue. That's the concept we talked before. Now we're just stating it that it's really measured for the average patient or for a 20 centimeter phantom of water or soft tissue. And only 1% of the x-rays will be transmitted through this amount of tissue. On this image, the top part here represents our linear attenuation coefficient. And if you remember, the linear attenuation coefficient means what percentage of my beam is being stopped for every centimeter. In this case, it's an easy number of 10%. So after one centimeter of, of tissue, I go from 100 to 90. If I do another one centimeter, it's from 90 to 81. So I'm losing 10% of my x-ray beam every time I move one centimeter. And what we need to know for this part is what factors affect uh, my half value layer and my linear attenuation coefficient. In this case, when we have a higher energy x-ray, our linear attenuation coefficient will be lower, meaning that we will lose less amount of 
x-ray beam per centimeter. So let's say in this case it was 10%, but if we have a higher energy x-ray, we might only lose 1%. So if we increase the energy of the x-ray beam, our linear attenuation coefficient goes down. If we increase the atomic number of the tissue we're imaging, our linear attenuation coefficient will go up because it will be able to stop more x-rays. The same applies for the density. If we increase the density of our x-ray of the material we're imaging, our linear attenuation coefficient goes up as well. If my linear attenuation coefficient is high, the amount of layering that will need to stop half of the x-ray beam will be small. By the same token, if I have a small layer here, my linear attenuation coefficient will be high. If I have a big layer here, it means that my linear attenuation coefficient is small, therefore I need to compensate by adding a thicker layer to get 50% of the x-ray attenuation. Going back to the rapid fire facts format, we know that our critical HBL for mammography is 0.5 millimeters of aluminum and for CT of the abdomen is 6 millimeters of aluminum. This is important for patient safety, so you should know it. Increasing the KB by 15%, we know will cause an increase in photons about four. So if we have uh, automatic exposure control, we will be required to reduce MAs for approximately 50%. Because by increasing our KB by 15%, our MAs will be increasing by around 50 to 60%. So we don't need those extra MAs, therefore we reduce those MAs to achieve uh, savings in radiation dose or to at the very least not increase it. This diagram will show you that for our x-ray beam three centimeters of soft tissue is equivalent to a half value layer. So three centimeters of soft tissue we already have half of our x-ray beam has been attenuated and I think that's all I want you to remember for, from here, and also that with increased KVPs, which are generated at the tube, if we increase the KVPs and therefore the KV of our energy, of our x-ray, we have a higher chance of scatter interaction with increased KV. The fluoroscopy air caramel rate is 10 milligrays per minute, and that's a rate, and you should know that number. The eye lens dose is about two milligrays for a skull radiograph. And remember, we said for an abdominal radiograph, we have three milligrays delivered. And when we go to a skull radiograph and we calculate the eye lens dose, it's gonna be in the range of two milligrays. Kerma times area will give us our Kerma area product, which it's used for cancer risk. It's not used for skin risk because since it's measured at 20 centimeters from the tube and it takes into account the area, I can have two different ways of having this. I can have a very intense x-ray beam, but a small area, for example, four grays and four centimeters, four times four gives me 16. So my Kerma area product is 16 for that example. However, if I have a lower energy x-ray of one gray, but I have a 16 centimeter area, one times 16 will also give me 16 and therefore both of those setup have the same amount of Kerma area product and the same risk for stochastic reactions. However, the one with the most concentrated beam has the higher risk for radiation in the skin. The Kerma area product for a radiograph is 
one gray, and this is gray per centimeter square. For barium and other modalities, you can see it goes up. It goes up to 20, and for IR, it even goes up to 200. And that's a Kerma area product. That's a type of approximation for stochastic or cancer risk in the patient. And that's all. I hope you like this format, and we'll keep adding some more reviews.